I mean, nobody goes out and buys a 70s muscle car because they think this is the safest way to take my kids to kindergarten. Welcome to Hard Up Garage Car Stories. On this episode, you'll be wowed by cars. Oh, and by stories. So this whole thing with Kevin Hart, right? Mm -hmm. And people over the years, the last 50 years, have crashed cars through being dicks, right? Mm -hmm. It's science. You drive a car that's too fast for you, you don't know what you're doing, you don't have the experience, you're gonna die, you're gonna get hurt, right? right? But life hasn't really changed so much since the 70s when Mopar released the flipping, like the Super B or the, the, the Daytona, right? And you go to Hertz and rent a Hertz Mustang, right? And back in the day, they used to tell you they had lower horsepower than they actually did. So that, you know, when you go and take it down the track and your Dodge has got, say, 170 horsepower and your buddy's Camaro's got 200 and you kick his ass, that's better publicity for Mopar than anything in the world, right? right. Even then, in the 70s, people would drive like jackasses and wreck them, right? The only reason people are kicking off nowadays, in my opinion, is because we've got social media that puts it in their faces that makes it apparent. And then the, go the government feel they have to step in and worry about all the the butterflies it's putting in their mum and dad's chest that's going to worry about their kids driving these cars. Right. But America was built on the V8. Life was built on making change, changes to cars after World War II to make them go faster, make them usable. So we didn't scrap all these cars that came back after World Wars and we just didn't get used. We made them faster, we made them bit bigger and better, we made them usable. And some of that came in the race, the race world which made America on the map, America, England, all these people. So hot rodding back in the 60s when real races used to drive single seaters where I've seen some of the videos and pictures where a guy is sat under the rear axle racing a car. If that diff goes, you're dead, right? People did it because they loved it. They did it because it was the right environment and they could enjoy it, right? But there's always been street racing. There's always been a way that people could enjoy their cars on the streets, which wasn't particularly legal, right? But then you get people like, Let's say Kevin Hart that goes and buys this badass car he's always dreamt of, and he wants a big engine in a cool classic car, and no one's ever gonna imagine that he's gonna roll it down a mountain, right? Right. So unless he walks in there, when you don't go to, to, to Nike and say, I want a pair of trainers, right? But when you put them up my leg, just in case I walk through stinging nettles or I get cactus on my leg, right? Because you don't, you buy it because it looks cool and your buddies like it, right? Full stop. When you go and get a car built or designed, you go, I want it in that color, I want a cooler or a cool engine, I want to show off to my buddies, right? At what point, when your heart is racing, you're in a shop buying your dream car, do you go, do you know what, I'm gonna need six point harnesses, I'm gonna need a roll cage, I'm gonna want the seats, like, let's put a box in the rear seat so no one can sit in it, right? Let's make this car have airbags that are modern and disgusting and take everything away from the look of this classic piece of Americana he's dreamed since he saw the Cuda back when he was like 10, 15 years old. Why would you go and put all these stuff, these modern, you know, version of safety items on a car that isn't really going to benefit your need? His need initially was to show off and be Kevin Hart in his badass car, right? Right. If he was going to go and buy a car to race around a racetrack, and look cool, then the people that built it would have done a different car for him. They'd have built him something that fed, you know, fed his requirement. Okay, I'm gonna, I want a Cuda, I want a badass, but there's a chance I might take it on a track. Cool, well, buddy, maybe we should put a cage in it. Right. right? Instead, he's probably going in and goes, I want a Cuda, I want it blue, I want it fast. I want it to look good. I live in LA, there's not a race, there is race tracks, but I'm not gonna take it. You know, he's got it for the showing off purposes of driving through LA. Right. So the car builders now, Possibly, let's just say it isn't, but people are looking at the car builder for their problems. We don't build cars for how we want to do them. We build cars for what the client asks, correct? Right. So how do you now move forward, build cars for clients that I'm gonna throw the book at you for what you want? I mean, do we have to do NDAs and hold agreements on a car when you build it? Like this is getting beyond the control. And America was built on this heart feeling of the V8, leave us alone. If we're gonna kill ourselves over these cars we built in our shop that can be built by some idiot with no skills, no training, but just- The idea of imposing personal responsibility on people is obviously a very you know, anti-libertarian idea. It's, it's this idea that we have to make people not hurt themselves, but it there's a lot of different contexts in which this has come up historically. One is like 
why do you have to wear motorcycle helmets? Like why it's in, in some states in the US, it's illegal to ride a motorcycle without a helmet. Well, a unhelmeted motorcycle rider is no greater danger to running into someone, right? It's not that uh, the only thing I'm saving them from by making it illegal is by hurt, make, keeping them from hurting themselves. And the, the, the general legal defense is that there are ramifications of people getting hurt. And so we should keep them from doing that if we can. And that it's expensive to taxpayers and people who have to pay the, for the health care yeah. of these people. It causes other negative economic externalities. And that's somewhat valid, but we're, we're really not talking about the world at large when we're talking about collector cars and things like that. And so the political arguments kind of break down. And it is worth just thinking about, like, is it is it our responsibility to do anything other than provide as a service the chance for people to buy what they want. And Porsche has had the greatest history of this from an OEM perspective. They've gotten sued over so many different cars, including Paul Walker's Widow and the first 930 turbos that were dubbed the Widow Makers because they had snap over steer and you know the dentist that bought them didn't know how to drive them and they would go die. And the, the families would collectively form these class actions and sue them. But I think... From most people who love cars and work in the car business, they do so because they are helping other car enthusiasts' dreams come true. And most people don't dream about driving their dream car in a way that they don't worry about maybe dying. And I think there's a part of driving where the danger is a huge part of the experience. And I think if we take it all out, even if we don't know it, we're going to eliminate something we love about cars if we make them too safe. And it's the freedom. Not only the freedom to go somewhere, but the freedom to decide what is safe enough. Nothing we do is safe. Eating that next piece of sushi, stepping outside in a rainstorm, driving the next mile in your car. None of it's safe. But we do certain things because it's worth the risks. But even if we had to minim if we were able to minimize all the risks, we do some things because the risks feel good. And feeling like we can control the risks enough, maybe not all the way, but enough is a portion of what makes driving some cars worthwhile. I mean, nobody goes out and buys a 70s muscle car because they think, this is the safest way to take my kids to kindergarten. They buy it because it's awesome. And part of the awesomeness is that it feels a whole lot different than hopping into their brand new minivan. They hear things. They feel things. They notice that, you know, I slide a lot more across this bench seat if I turn than if I do in my Honda Accord. And I think that that is one of the most fun things about loving cars is being able to make those types of decisions. That, you know what? This trash control doesn't exist. This trash control makes things worse when I try to do stupid things in a car. I like that version. Guys, tune in next time for another episode of Hard Up Garage Car Stories, where you'll be wowed by stories about cars.